Hello and welcome to Betfred's Football Show. So much to uh, talk about on and off the pitch. We'll talk about Chelsea uh, a little later in the show. Let's just start, obviously, our thoughts with everyone uh, from the Ukraine at the moment. It is really, really horrible uh, what is going on. It really is very, very grim. But we are going to talk about football for the next 20 minutes. I know at times it can feel irrelevant, but the Premier League is back this weekend. Paul Parks is alongside me. And Parks, a huge game for your old club, the Manchester Derby. Now, I want to take you back to your playing days. I know it was a long time ago, and you can barely remember now, Parks. But yeah. look, you were obviously, you know, a London lad. You quickly knew in that dressing room what the Manchester Derby meant, didn't you? Oh, I certainly did. I, <clears throat> I was definitely very ignorant about what football was all about until I went and lived 220 miles away in the, north, the northwest of England and I slowly understood what it meant about winning a game of football and losing a game of football. But then the other side of it is losing or losing to your neighbours, winning games against your neighbours, everything about it. A city like Manchester depended so much on its football. It affected people's lives so much. Could you feel that the build-up was different in the week leading up to a Manchester derby? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. It's what everyone talked about. He's walking past. Everything was always about that. And I played in derbies as such when I was in London. All the derbies that I played in was, was generally against, I think I played one or two, maybe against Queen's Park Rangers as a Fulham player. The others was against um, Chelsea as a Fulham and a QPR player. And... They were big games at that given time. But, you know, the moment I played in the Manchester derby, I suddenly realised I, you know, I was playing in a, a proper derby game, one that really, really mattered, that affected people's weekends, it affected their week, their working week, it affected their lives in a certain way over, over that, that result and, and the performance as well. And you were quite successful at Manchester United in a derby, weren't you? I mean, one particular game sticks in the mind. But 3-2 win at Main Road in November 1993. Uh, City were 2-0 up, weren't they? Niall Quinn. And then a goal from Keane and two from Cantona. You won 3-2. And it was, uh, well, great celebrations from the Man United fans and the Man United players at the end of the game. It certainly was. I mean, 2-0 down at half-time. It was walked into the dressing room and the boss just wasn't happy. He was absolutely, as the saying goes, spitting feathers. And I'll leave it there. And he just virtually just walked out the dressing room and left it to Brian Kidd. And as he left the dressing room, Warren Clark was walking past and he shoved him in there. And he asked Warren Clark to give us a kick up the whatever and get us going. And Warren Clark just virtually used words to the effect of, why am I bothered? I'm a blue. So, um, and, that, and that was Warren Clark. Um, but yeah, Kiddo just said a few things in the typical Brian Kidd way. We all listened, as, you, as we all would do to Brian Kidd, and we come out second half. The thing about it, though, is that we could have gone 3-0 down if it wasn't for Peter Schmeichel, because I remember David White went through and almost went through on his own, and it could have been 3-0, and, and then would have, that team talk by Kiddo at half-time would have been a waste of time, but good fortune was with us, and once we got over that, we just controlled that whole second half, and it was like virtually some, you know, I played in quite a few of these games for United where we come from behind. It was just like a, a pendulum swinging of just, it's going to happen in a minute, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Just con completely just controlled and dominated, dominated that game. And, you know, and we ended up in the goal. I think Keno scored the win, I think, at the end um, off, a Dennis, off a Dennis Irwin ball, I think it was, right across the front of the goalkeeper. And, um, but the thing I remember most was um, at half time was the celebrations of the City fans. I mean, we got inundated with Turkish delights by City fans as we went out for the kickoff because we just that week had been knocked out of the Champions League by Galatasaray. So that's what the City fans done to us. And then I remember walking, I remember walking in, uh, walking in, and the City fans were all City players were just celebrating, you know, with the fans round by the tunnel. And I've always been that way. Even though you go in front at halftime, whatever score, football has a funny way of throwing egg in your face. Doesn't matter what era, football does that. And it does that 
today, even with football supporters who shout and scream the following week, the picture changes. Football can change so quickly, and it, it did change in that second half, and there was a lot of mournful City players after that, because to be honest, that second half, we could have scored five or six, to be honest, but we left it till three minutes, from the end of three minutes of normal time to go and win the game. You went there as champions. That season, you won the double. Now, times have changed now. Manchester United dominated Manchester in the 90s. And now it's Man City dominating the city. How big a gap is there now between Man City and Manchester United? I mean, it's a lot in points, but how big is the gap right now, would you say? Well, I think if you add the points to the actual fact of levels of performances, <clears throat> um, cons levels of consistency, um, the levels of discipline within the players of Man City compared to Manchester United, it's, it's a Grand Canyon. It is a Grand Canyon, what you're the difference between it. But as with football, it doesn't make a difference. That can just change over 90 minutes and the team can suddenly go against the grain and and win a game of football and then people will celebrate but the gap's never that gap isn't going to change you can't just close that gap up over 90 minutes of football so I think the honest United fan knows the difference between Man Manchester City and Manchester United they know that but they will just take anything from this game at the weekend just just to keep themselves in close to, you know to that full spot and it is embarrassing, I think, for sick for a lot of um, Manchester United fans having to talk that way. It's something that a lot of them would have laughed about Arsenal, the way Arsenal were talking about that, the way Arsenal was celebrating on the pitch because they qualified for the Champions League. And a lot of United fans will be just thinking themselves, you know, that they can't can't believe we're in a situation. But I think we have to understand, Mark, is that life, it go, you know, is in cycles. Football definitely goes in cycles. And you mentioned at the top of it about United in the 90s and now we're talking about City. We look at Liverpool in the in the 90s and all of a sudden we're seeing the way you know, they've turned. And that's the way football is and that's the way life is. So we have to expect that 100% dominance that, you know, year after year doesn't happen. There's always going to be changes. We can talk about leads of the 70s. We still talk about leads of the 70s, but yet when you talk about their achievements, they can't, they can't and don't compare to Manchester United of the 90s and the early 2000s or Liverpool of the 80s. You know, they don't, it just doesn't compete that way. But we still talk about Leeds and, you know, how great they were in their given time. So, you know, at the moment, it's a joint one at the moment between City and Liverpool, City and Liverpool at this moment. Do you still think there's a title race on? I mean, obviously, it's only six points now. Liverpool have got a game in hand with winning the Carabao Cup last weekend. Liverpool have got to go to Man City as well. Yeah, there's still a massive race on. It's not over. It's nowhere near over at this moment in time. City, so Liverpool will be hoping that maybe in certain ways United can go there and cause a problem because we have to look at and say the away team has, has always <laughs> done themselves quite a bit of justice. And, so, and you know, over this picture, so they'll be maybe hoping for that. I don't really see it, you know, seeing is believing, as they say. But I mean, it's gonna, it's, it's, if it happens, I will, I'm happy to eat humble pie, but know that it can change in the next game because that's the way Manchester United are. I think City had their little bit of a scare against Everton, I think that would have woken them up. I think Pep will tweak it, I don't think they'll get caught like that again in certain ways. So um, United go there as massive underdogs. Um, we can talk about Ralph's, Ralph's um, stats, but when you look at the performances under Ralph, <laughs> that doesn't come into it. But Manchester United have got a good record out of the Etihad of Lake, haven't they? So they, they but, could upset Man City. That's the beauty of football, isn't it? Yes, that's the beauty of football. But as you might know already, I'm, I'm not a believer of stats because stats... Are there to be to make to hide things or to try and bring things out to embellish things. I look, I believe in performances, and I would look at City's performances and the way their players have been performing over over a duration of time. I would look at Manchester United and look at it. And if you're a Manchester United player, you would have been watching City, and you would have seen it, 
and you would be you would be a little bit worried. You you couldn't feel any other way. It's it's a human emotion when you see things that are better than what you are, and maybe what and what your your collective around you are as well. So you'll be concerned and you'll be hoping that you can actually go in there and you can poke the bear by scoring that first goal and then hope that you can survive the rest. And a word on Ralph Rannick. Whoever Manchester United bring in this summer is possibly the biggest signing for a long, long time, isn't it? Because the, the, the pressure's on to get back to challenging four titles, isn't it, for Manchester United? So ever be a point where it's Pochettino or Ten Hag, the pressure is on. Yeah, it's, it's about the manager, which is going to be the bravest to take the job. I still believe, and I've said it a thousand times, and you've heard me say it a thousand times, Mark, is that it doesn't matter who comes in and takes the job. It's about what's going to happen above them. What, what, how are they going to change? Are they going to change the way, the way they've been since Sir Alex Ferguson has retired? Are they going to allow the managers to manage in the way they want to do? Are they going to allow the manager to get the players that he wants at the right times, not waiting and then missing out and then pulling someone in at January and hoping that they can deliver? And that's, that's my biggest concern. So you can go and bring them in. You can look at what's happening at Ajax. You can talk about what's going on there. You can look at, you know, Van der Sar's there as the director. You can think, so that works great with them. But that's because the system's been running for years and the way they deliver deliver players and the way they work. Different, a club run completely different to Manchester United. They get them in young, they breed them, they, and then they bring them through and bang, they go out and they sell them on after great performances in the league and Champions League. We look at um, Pochettino, done great, turned round Tottenham. Tottenham, certainly in my opinion, overachieved with him in charge, playing away at Wembley for two years, qualifying for Champions League, getting to a Champions League final. Um, people say his weakness, he hasn't won anything. Someone's got to start somewhere. There's only so many things that people, clubs and individuals can win. So put that one to bed. That's a weak argument, that is. Jason was an individual. You know, people mostly said, oh, Sir Alex Ferguson, only won things in Scotland. Scotland Scottish League's rubbish. Anyone can do that. But I'll tell you what, it gave him a great grounding to come in and then deliver discipline into every player who come in and played under him and achieved. And that's what he needs at the moment. A manager who is allowed to discipline players, not a manager who comes in and every every player knows that they're weak because up above is running the ship the same way. Run it as a football club rather than as a club as a sorry. Run it as a football club rather than a club that's a marketing tool, and then you might start achieving. Well, as a new chief exec in charge, it's a huge Sunday for Manchester United. It's a huge summer for Manchester United looking for a permanent manager. Go on, give us a prediction then for the Manchester Derby Parks. I can't look beyond them. I can't, um, I want to wear my heart and sleeve. I can't, I can't wear rose tinted glasses. I've got to go for a Manchester United win. And you so you're going for a Manchester win? United win? Sorry, I've got that wrong there. I mean a Manchester City win. Oh, I delivered that completely wrong. See, there's something there in my head telling me I want a Manchester United win. I don't believe I'm going to get one. Simple as that. Well, they've done it before, Parks. You could be surprised on Sunday, but he is going for a Man City win. And then do they kick on and win the title? I would I would say so. Everyone's talking about that game against Liverpool, which is going to be a, a, a cracking um, experience to be around. We don't know the quality we're going to yet we're going to get yet, but I know that's going to be atmosphere-wise, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. If, that's if it's a if it's virtually like a playoff game as such, but I think City will go in there and the right get to that and they'll have a little bit of control of the situation. Well, talking about the title race, Liverpool play first of all on Saturday at 5.30 at home to West Ham. Of course, West Ham uh, beat them at the London Stadium early on this season. And I, I've been really impressed with Liverpool of late. Uh, people thought they might drop points in January. They didn't with the players away in the African nations. Uh, Klopp's got them ticking over quite nicely, hasn't he? Yeah, just at the moment, they, they look unbeatable, Mark. Um, you just wonder, you know, you know, who's going to go out there and outscore them, to be honest, really. Their strength is obviously what they can put, you know, put up front. When you, 
when you look at a front three, and I think their best front three, the front three that people would fear the most, fear the most, I should say, would be Mane, Jota and Salah. They're the ones that I think everyone would fear more than anything. Jota is a, is a problem. Well, for me, no, you knew he was the link man, Jota. You know, he's the one through the middle. He's, he's, he's the one there, their focal point through the middle, about, what, five foot ten, and he's a, you know, he's a decent person to play the ball. When he holds the ball up, he knows how to win a foul, is what every, most clubs are looking for at this moment in time. And I know a team that plays in red, what, 40-odd miles away that could do with a centre forward as well, by the way. So, um, right. but they, they are, they are very good. You look at their midfield, and they've still got that little bit of flair in there, but they've still got that rigid side to it, that bit that just plays the simple pass, the easy pass, never always trying to Hollywood pass. And that's been Liverpool all through the years that I've known Liverpool. I've grown up with Liverpool playing in that fashion of, in midfield. And you look at them defensively, and you still look at the weakest spot, which everyone aims for, as we saw with Chelsea, everyone aims for Alexander-Arnold. He's the weakest link in that back line because... He doesn't want to, in my opinion, really want to defend. Not a lover of tracking back. Doesn't really want to put his foot in there to defend and defend his territory. His, his whole focus is getting forward. And, well, it doesn't seem to be so bad for Liverpool, though. Are you, are you just being a, a grumpy old former fullback, Parks? No, I'm just looking at where teams look to exploit it. I mean, I was at London Stadium when they, when they, West Ham deservedly beat um, yep. Liverpool, and that's where that's where they exploited it. They really did exploit it. I mean, they put Bowen out there, and then they um they brought on um Arthur Masaraku. They brought him on, and he and everything was was getting in behind him. Um, then Rama got the ball, got him, but was getting in behind him every time he he wanted to step forward. They stepped in behind the other way, and it was causing massive problems. Matip was having kittens because he had no he had no help. He was being pulled out into wide areas. And it's and it's a problem they've got. But it's about a team who are brave enough to try and exploit that because if it goes against you, then you've got someone who wants to cross the ball as often as possible in Alexander Arnold. Uh, you mentioned Salah, 19 Premier League goals this season. Come on, give us a prediction for the 5.30 kickoff, Liverpool versus West Ham. <laughs> I've got, it's, a, it's a Liverpool win. Just to the way West Ham are at this moment in time, they, they can't change the team and they can't really improve it. I think everyone can name virtually a West Ham 11 and you might add another, maybe flip around with two other players. This game's only going one. West Ham have got to go beyond to get anything from this game. I've got to go with a, a Liverpool win. Um, a goal from, I can't, I'm gonna, I've got to look at a 2 or 3 nil. Uh, the early kickoff on Saturday is Leicester versus Leeds. Obviously, Leeds got a new manager, Jesse Marsh, a former Leipzig manager. Um, are you surprised of sacked Bielsa, or did he have to go because of a number of goals conceded of late? I think it was mostly Leeds' toughest ever decision about a tough. And when I say the toughest decision, I mean it with the fans having to accept him going, but not wanting him to go. Somehow he managed to get into the um, into the fans' heart, despite his whole manner, um, what he achieved when he missed out on promotion, and he got on promotion from the champ um, from the championship. And I saw him play quite a few times um, when they played at Loftus Road, and you know they, the support they got is was still is still a hundred percent. It's incredible their support that they they have with them, the way they wanted to play football. QPR always beat them though, but um, it was they 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 were they were good good to watch in certain ways. But there was a, you know what's happened was always going to happen at some point. They were going to get exploited, and the fashion in which they wanted to play was difficult for players. Asking the players for a duration of a season to go man to man is very very difficult mentally to players. And then once you get beaten, you get men, you get think yourself you want help but someone else has been running another direction. It got difficult. Second half of the season is the one where players get wiser, coaches get wiser, then you have to have new ideas and add new things. He wasn't doing that. And rather than make changes um, in his tactics, he changed personnel if a player didn't do what he wanted to do. And it cost him in the end. 
Have they got enough to stay up? Or is it, a, is it key getting Bamford and Phillips back as soon as possible? Well, I think they're talking... I mean, I did see a few months back that uh, um, Calvin Phillips should be back some point this month. You know, I think that's, you know, I think that would definitely lift the players to get him back in there. Then players can then get back to their acquired positions rather than playing that position. Bamford as a focal point through the middle will make a difference because defenders will be aware of what he's about. And, you know, and I think he's respecting in a way. I think definitely he'll get more respect from the fans, from Leeds fans, even more so now because they know how much they've missed him. I think Leeds, I believe Leeds will stay up I would, in certain ways. I would like them to stay up because I want to see as many of the big sides in this country up against each other, obviously on an equal playing field in certain ways and getting, you know, and Leeds getting them maybe in a position where they believe they should be is trying to contest a European spot. Right, we're going to have to uh, speed up Parks talking about relegation. Norwich, Brentford. Brentford are on this awful run. Norwich, surely Norwich are down. Five points is too big a gap, isn't it? At this stage of the season. So it is, but Dean Smith has made a difference. They are a team now which are definitely more difficult to beat. I believe that if Norwich go and win this, they will believe that they've got a chance with some of the games they've got left. Brentford, if they lose this one, this could mentally, in a way, destroy them the way it's gone from. I'm one of those people who stuck up from believe they were going to stay up. Christian Eriksen has really got to make a difference in there. Ivan Tony needs to score goals. He hasn't been scoring goals. I thought the workload now might be taken off him with Christian Eriksen filling that berth in midfield, which he was trying to do. He's trying to do two jobs. So Embuena has got to start scoring. He, he misses too many opportunities. Good player, really good player of his feet, needs to score goals. Um, Monday night, Spurs, Everton. Wow, that's a, that's a really, that's a tough, tough game. You just don't know which has which way that's going to go. The way Everton have been, they would say they was unlucky. They should have had a penalty against Manchester City. Forget the penalty. Look at the way they performed. They were backs to the wall. They were counter-attacking. No, um, yeah, they raised themselves for a big game against the, potentially the champions of this division. Um, that's all they've done. They've got to go to Spurs. Spurs, hot and cold, or maybe I'm doing hot and cold at the service, really, describing Spurs at the moment. <laughs> Manager who's low at the moment, very on the low ebb. A team that don't know what's going on because of they've got ownership problems, they've got a chairman problem, they don't know which way to go in. They don't know, are they going to give 100% to a manager who kind of is talking in a manner that he's going to walk away, which doesn't help because players will take the easy road out and use that as their excuse. This game stands every chance of being a draw, in my opinion. Uh, right, some uh, other Saturday three o'clock kickoffs before we finish. Aston Villa, Southampton Parks. Aston Villa. I've got to look at the way Southampton's form has been as late. They've been fantastic. And I'm going to go, I've got to believe that Southampton's going to win that. Aston Villa had their early bit with Stephen Gerrard, but they've been, I think they've, you know, everyone was expecting more from Villa and showing. And to be honest, you know, you look at it now and you say to yourself, Maybe Dean Smith should have stayed. There hasn't been any great difference. The public Grealish has gone in certain ways. They do function better, me as a team, because they're not reliant anymore, forced to rely on Grealish, but they haven't stepped forward. So I look at maybe Southampton to win that one. Uh, Burnley, Chelsea. Burnley have done well of late. They've, I think they've lost their last two games, haven't they? In the Premier League and I think the Cup game, I think it was, they lost. So um, I would look at the way it's been from their home to Chelsea. Chelsea showed good, great. They were fantastic against Liverpool. Best they've been in weeks, maybe months. Um, just about got over the line against Luton, but it was a changed team and they've, they fought for an act. They'll fight through against Burnley and they'll get a result with Burnley. Uh, and of course, uh, Chelsea up for sale. The statement from Roman Abramovich last night, the sale of the club will not be fast-tracked, but will follow due process or not be asking for any of the loans to be repaid. Moreover, I've instructed my team to set up a charitable foundation where all net proceeds from the sale will be donated. So Chelsea is up for sale. Uh, Newcastle, Brighton. I've got to go. I've got to go with Newcastle. 
they've, you know, they've got new players. They've got new players available to them. But a lot of the older old players, there were the previous players. A lot of them have stepped forward now. I think they've found a different way of playing. They're allowed to attack. They're not sitting on the edge of their box. I think the cells has been taken away. That's allowed them to push up even higher. So they do go forward more. They are scoring goals. Um, there's been a reprieve now for Joe Linton. Joe Linton's playing in midfield. Joe Linton, I saw him in the armband at um, London Stadium. He's, you know, he's become a breath of fresh air now, Joe Linton. He's found his way. All his goals were left on the plane from when he arrived from Brazil. So, at the moment, so now he's added something else to his game. Newcastle are looking quite decent now. We know now that they're not going to go down. Be interesting. I'm interested to see what happens next season in Newcastle. And one game left to talk about: Wolves versus Crystal Palace. Wolves were Wolves disappointed me last weekend. Um, the game against West Ham. I expected more from them. He made three changes. I think three. You know, well, two of them at least. No Jimenez, <coughs> Martinho on the bench. <clears throat> and I think those two are integral to a Wolves side that can compete against anyone in the Premier League on their day. And they didn't start against West Ham. I think that lifted West Ham. And West Ham got what they deserved in the end. Wolves didn't come to light until the last 10, 15 minutes when he brought on those two players in the last 10, 15 minutes. And it made a difference to Wolves and a little bit more luck. And they could have maybe have got themselves a draw, but... I think I don't. I don't fancy him in that game. I fancy. I'm going to look at that. Brighton haven't done a lot. I'm just going. I'm going to go with Wolves to maybe nick it, but only if they start with their key players. And uh, I said we'd spoken about all the games. We haven't spoken about Watford versus Arsenal live on Sky, two o'clock Sunday. This is the training ground derby. That's what this <laughs> one's about. That's what it's about. Because um, Watford train at. London Coney, which is Arsenal's old training ground, so that's that's made it into a little bit more of a derby in that sense because you can't really call because Watford isn't really London; it's to the north west of London, but it's outside of London as such, and that's as as much as derby as it kind of gets. Watford, I saw them play against Crystal Palace; but they wasn't good. I, I don't want to say any more than that because Watford fans might have a go at me. Um, well, they might agree with me, some of them, but Palace got what they deserved. That They scored four. They got, in, as far as I'm concerned, what they deserved in the end from Manchester United, which was a point, because they worked hard for it. They couldn't give Manchester United enough opportunities to go and score a goal. But when it comes to that last half an hour, they, they ran their legs off. The players were shattered. They could not believe their luck that they stayed in that game long enough to be able to get themselves over the line, to get that point, which gives them that little bit of belief and gave their fans belief as well. Their fans enjoyed it as much as well. So Arsenal, in my opinion, will win this game, but they're going to have to fight for it more now because Watford's last performance at home against Palace, which was which again, which, which again was another big game for them, um, which they failed. I think they're going to have to give more and they will give more but Arsenal just to get over the line. Uh, right, Park, so let's start, uh, sorry, let's finish where we started with the Manchester derby. Right, I'm going to leave you with a final word. Pretend you're in that dressing room at 20 past four on Sunday. What would you say to the Manchester United team? I couldn't put, I could put words together, but then I'd have to put words in, which, which means that people couldn't listen to it and you might be throwing off, throwing off a TV. But um, I would I'd be asking individuals, the key individuals, to actually to be disciplined, be disciplined for the young players in the side, show them show more application, play play for the jersey, and for one thing, do not scold your teammates publicly. Someone makes a someone makes a mistake or doesn't do what you want them to do, encourage them. Or don't do anything at all, but do not raise your arms at them and make them try and belittle them to make yourself look good in front of the fans. Thanks so much, Paul Parker. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching. And football this weekend will once again stand with Ukraine. <laughs>